I feel embarrassed that I never got a chance to really cover the Ukrainian uh, military for various reasons because it just couldn't make it happen. And then in the end, we all wound up covering the, uh, the eastern uh, part of Ukraine because it was more accessible for a period of time. So this was uh, much more doable. Uh, I feel that in that, in that regard, I should have definitely tried to find a way to cover the other side. It just didn't, just didn't materialize. How did you work there as an American uh, in Donetsk? Everybody thought I was Dutch. <laughs> For some reason, in the early days, I didn't have to show my passport so much. And when I did, it was more like wink, wink. But I had all the accreditation, so uh, maybe if I'd come maybe much later, it would have been much harder. But how did the fighters treat you? How they didn't know what to do with me. I suspect to a certain degree the fighters found me an amusing, you know, sidebar. I mean, I didn't come at them serious enough for them to see me as anything that was going to, you know, break up their day. I didn't come at them as a journalist. I didn't come at them as a tourist either. I think I was a curiosity. I think I was really lost in Ukraine because I really didn't know how to... to I was going through two things. One, I was reaching a point where, well, what do I have to say? Do I have anything to say? Do I really fit in this? Is this really a story I should follow? Uh, people said, well, it's sort of like Chechnya. In the end, it's not. I mean, um, I couldn't find my way in it. And I was, it was at a, also at a period where I was also questioning my own uh, vulnerability, my own, let's say, did I have enough wind left in my sails to, to, to do such a story? Well, I discovered one thing I did get out of Ukraine. I discovered that, yeah, I can still do this story. I just need to um, not think about uh, all the problems of doing it and just find a solution to doing it. The shocking thing for me, and that's probably something that I have to wrestle with, is that once I was able to I mean, when it came to photographing the, the, the death or the, the, the violence, then I, I found, I knew that I could do it. That sounds horrific to say, but in a way, the, my training or the way that I see things sometimes, I really need to be pushed really up against it. I mean, I really need to be given no quarter where I have to confront it, demons and all. And I think that that's when it, when it, when it works. Slow down. We have to slow down. We have to stop and uh, put our fingers in the air and see which way the wind is blowing. We have to, uh, like the Indians, American Indians, put our ears to the ground and listen to the foot, foot the, uh, the, the feet, uh, the sounds. We don't listen enough. We, we're, we're so consumed of um, getting there, doing it, and, and getting away and not staying there long enough to really understand why we went in the first place. How to challenge the fatigue of the same place and the same, you know, photo? Because, you know, like, let's say in Ukraine, there would be at first the houses which are uh, destroyed, then later there would be people in the bunkers, the old ladies and the kids. And then, you know, it works once for once with one photography, maybe with one report. Later, the story is still there. You come to the same basement, it's still there, and nobody cares after three months. But you have to ask yourself, why do you make this story? Do you making the story because you want... You make the story because, as I said today, is that you have... Somebody has to be there to document what happened so that later we can look back and try to change what happened. We have to have proof. We are messengers. We are, we, are, we are storytellers. We have to have this information somewhere where we can say, this happened, and then sit back and analyze why. But if you haven't got the proof, you haven't got the evidence that it happened, then there's nothing. Yes, yeah, so that would be my final, that really here we got the, I mean, as a Ukrainian, as a Ukrainian journalist say, like we have a country where the journalists have never used to cover the war. They have to learn very, very fast. But now we are in the time when 
it's not interesting any longer. Not because it doesn't sell, because it's not that extens intensive as it was a year ago or like half a year ago. It's all the same story about some low intensity fighting and the IDPs and all that stuff. So um, as somebody who had seen a lot of countries who were at war, and you know, followed the societies for a longer period than time than two years. So, what would be probably your advice also to our, you know, to the journalists who work here, who were brought to these circumstances, and who also sometimes have this dilemma because it's the war in their own country, of course. So there is a huge battle also here for the people who think like we have just to report, and the others who try to, you know, be maybe more patriotic or whatever you call it. But Journalists that are here, this is your country, so you need to you you need to document what's happening in your country, and you need to find a way to, that gives it a a complete picture, because the outside world really doesn't get it, and uh, and to believe in what you're doing, you know, and I think that that's the most important. I mean, you're Ukrainian, I'm American, but but I'm sure you have roots here. In the United States, I have no roots. I'm rootless, so I don't have that affinity. I can't. I can say I'm American. My passport says I'm American. I know my parents were American, but there's nothing that ties me to America. I don't have a house there. I don't live there or any of that. Uh, I lived in Paris for 23 years. I have nothing that really that can say holds on to me in Paris. My agency, NOR, is based in Amsterdam, but there's nothing that ties me to Amsterdam. And now I live in Beirut, and for sure there's nothing that ties me there. So I'm ruthless, but people that have homes and have places and are living there and that there's conflicts or situations happening, then it's up to them to document and tell the rest of us because that's a great chance to, to write or to film or to uh, photograph something that you know and live and that will, that, that's, it's like giving something back. You're giving something back to your culture, to your society and to your world, to your life. And I think that that's, uh, that maybe has to be enough. Unless, of course, you want to try to take it, take it past that, you know, if you want to go and try to be a journalist internationally. But then it means that you then have to understand what's happening. Uh, but how you also, do you, I, besides, you know, Yuri Kozarev, whom you know well, you spent 10 years in Russia. You probably know a lot of Russian journalists, different ones. And there is something happened to the Russian journalism, to the Russian media. There was a great potential. I remember well, there was a great media. I mean, the very technologically advanced and pretty rich, let's say, yeah. you know, and the wars, they were breaking great stories. But later in the end, it's all was squeezed. Uh, technologically, the federal channels are extremely way advanced. They could compare to any international networks. But there was something which changed in the also Russian journalism. You know, there is this handful of the independent ones and a huge amount of people who are sure. uh, working with the state propaganda, though they even, many of them had started a while ago and were like not playing the car, card of the regime. So, how would you also do this, see this transformation? Tragic. I think that what's happening in Russia, for example, is tragic because uh, they were so close to a democratic ideal that uh, how it got literally hijacked, taken away from them, is tragic. And how the, the West doesn't, or the rest of the world doesn't seem to get it, that the rights of uh, common everyday Russian citizens are being taken away while we spend a lot of time just focusing on Putin, but we don't do stories on what's really going on in Russia because we don't have access or we don't care or whatever, but we have to do those stories and, and that's tough and we have to make sacrifices and that's tougher because the consequences, the stakes are high. So the possibility of being killed <laughs> or disappearing <laughs> They, they, they love and we want happiness and we want that beat going off in our heads. Why should I care about what's happening to somebody over there? They, I don't, they're not my culture. I have nothing to say to them. I mean, what's the point? We just don't have the humanity that we at one time as a people have had. And uh, I think that that's our biggest tragedy of all. 
did we uh, used to have it? Yep. Was it different then? I'm naive. I think we had it to a certain degree. I think that I think we spent more time looking each other in the eye. We didn't spend time. Uh, I mean, when you take a picture, you have to t with, a, with a film camera. When you take a picture, you your eye has to be on the subject the whole time, because you're taking that picture, and you're looking to see how this is moving, and you're like waiting for that breath to push that shutter, and you're doing that. But today with digital, when you take a picture, you go ah, to see if you got it. Oh. And you've broken the contact. And if you're doing that in a situation like a war, a conflict, or a situation where somebody's like got their guts hanging out, you know, they're using some kind of pan or something to hold them in, <laughs> and you go and take the picture, and then you and I go to look, it means you've broken off contact. It means you don't care about them. You only care about the picture. That's the only thing you care about. Ah, I got the picture, so now go away. I don't want to see your guts all over the ground. <laughs>